Hello, everyone. Welcome back again. Uh, we're now in chapter 15 and we're going to be talking about uh, traditional uh, policy tools. And so our, in our previous video, uh, we set up the federal funds market and look at how it worked. What we want to see in this video is to see exactly how the Fed influences this market. And we're going to focus on the traditional three tools that the Fed has historically used to manage monetary policy. So back before uh, 2007 and 2008, the Fed had three basic tools for most of its history to influence uh, uh, monetary policy. So it's had the required reserve ratio, the discount rate, which is the interest rate that the Fed charges uh, banks uh, for loan reserves, and open market operations, abbreviated OMO. And as we'll discover, it has used historically open market operations because open market operations have many advantages relative to the discount rate and relative to reserve requirements. So reserve requirements, let's think about how the Fed would run policy if it used reserve requirements as its primary policy tool. Well, suppose it wanted to pursue an expansionary policy. What it would do is do one of two things, usually either reduce the uh, rate of required reserves in terms of the percentage rate from say 10% to say 8%, or it would reduce the types of uh, deposits that are subject to reserves. But historically, generally, it would reduce the required reserve rate, the percentage, the fraction. And what this would do, this would decrease the demand for reserves in the banking system overall. And in effect, it would give banks more reserves to lend out, and that would be able to go through the multiple deposit creation process that we previously talked about in another video. If the Fed wanted to pursue a contractionary policy, it would do precisely the opposite. It would raise the required reserve rate or increase the types of deposits that are subject to reserves. Both of those actions would tend to reduce the available reserves for banks to lend, and therefore those would not be able to go through the multiple deposit creation process that we've previously talked about. Historically, though, the Fed has not used the required reserve rate as a day-to-day -day, day -day policy tool. And the, the bottom line for this is that it, there's a problem with symmetry. Banks, not surprisingly, would really like, on average, the, ra the uh, rate of required reserves to be lower because that would give them more reserves to loan out. More loans, of course, would generally turn to increase in profits. But on the other hand, banks would not like very much reserve rates or reserve ratios to be increased because that would tend to contract the volume of loans they can make and that would tend to reduce their deposits. And since banks usually in ordinary circumstances uh, tend to keep reserves to a required minimum, they wouldn't have much to play with. And so that, again, there's a problem. Banks would really like reserves on average to be lowered, but would not like reserves on average to be increased. And of course, to conduct monetary policy, you need to sometimes pursue an expansionary policy sometimes need to pursue a contractionary policy. So there would be an issue there. Moreover, there has been a time uh, over, over a period here that uh, many countries have either reduced or sometimes outright eliminated uh, reserve requirements. And the idea here is that when reserves don't earn interest, which, which used to be historically the case, having required reserves uh, on deposit with a central bank acted as a form of a tax. And so there would be competition between countries. And then finally, the last time the Fed has uh, changed uh, its reserve requirement uh, uh, procedures was all the way back in 1992. So the point here should be it's very uncommon for the Fed to use this um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Then there's the discount window. It turns out the discount window uh, is historically uh, the original policy tool that the Fed had. And the idea behind this is incredibly simple. Suppose the Fed wanted to pursue an expansionary policy. All it would do is lower the interest rate on loans it uh, uh, charged to banks. Banks, seeing a lower interest rate, would borrow more reserves from the Fed. Those additional reserves could then go through the multiple deposit creation process. So the overall process is exceptionally simple. It works exactly in reverse too. If the Fed wants to pursue a contractionary policy, it would simply raise the discount rate Banks would cut back on uh, reserve or borrowing of reserves. They'd have few reserves to go through the multiple deposit creation process. And in that way, that would act as a contractionary policy. The difficulty here, though, is this. The Fed can't make banks borrow more from it if, for example, it lowers the federal funds rate. 
it requires cooperation on the part of banks. And that lack of cooperation sometimes would get in the way of the Fed's uh, using the policy tool, this particular policy tool, on a day-to-day -day basis. And what they did is that over time, they figured out rather than the day-to-day -day policy tool, that the discount uh, rate uh, served a much better function. It served as a window of uh, a lender of last resort, meaning a source of emergency backup funds for the financial system. And the, the Fed has sort of two uh, different particular uses of the discount window. Uh, it has what's called the primary or the standing credit facility. And this is the, this serves as sort of the backup to the entire financial system. And the way it sets things up is that the discount rate, as I mentioned in a previous video, is generally set above the federal funds rate. And so banks, if they're healthy and in need of emergency funds can borrow all that they want from the Fed. So again, the bottom line here is that the, the discount window serves as a, uh, a backup source of funds for the financial system. But besides serving up as, back, as backup funds for the, the entire financial system, it also serves the purpose for in, uh, particular banks that are having their own financial difficulties. So the secondary credit is available for uh, financial institutions that are having their own particular difficulty and these loans tend to be somewhat for uh, longer term and therefore banks that are relatively desperate and are unable to borrow in, for example, the federal funds market. And so the, the point here is that discount window, the Fed has found uh, a much better use for it in terms of serving as an emergency source of funds here. So what's interesting about the discount window also is the ability of the Fed to sort of bail out or at least postpone problems in a financial institution creates, what call, creates what's called a moral hazard problem. That is, that changes the incentive of bank managers to behave in certain ways. So what might happen is that a manager of a troubled institution might take more risks with bank funds, knowing that both the discount window from the Fed stands ready and the fact that uh, its depositors are insured by the FDIC. And in fact, just recently, the deposit insurance has been expanded. And even at one point during the most recent financial crisis, banks were able to issue debt that was guaranteed by the FDIC. So there created some interesting moral hazard problems. And so the Fed is very careful about its use of the discount window. This now brings us to open market operations. And it turns out that open market operations are used virtually every business day. And we'll talk about in a second here why that's the case. It turns out that there are a number of really interesting and helpful advantages of open market operations relative to the discount window and relative to reserve requirements. And what happens is, and I'll show you the graph here in, in just a minute, uh, that if the Fed wants to pursue an expansionary policy, uh, what it does is it will make a purchase of government securities in the financial market. So they'll go into the uh, government debt market, just like any other buyer would. They will buy these government securities. Now, the difference is the Fed, of course, has to pay for these government securities when it buys them in the, in the government bond market. Well, in order to do that, it simply credits a bank's reserve account uh, with the Fed. So, for example, if the Fed bought $1 billion in securities from a bank, they would take the securities and they would pay the bank by crediting the bank's reserve account by $1 billion. So now the bank would have an additional $1 billion of reserves. And when that happens, as we'll see here in just a second, the federal funds rate will tend to fall. It works exactly in reverse too. If the Fed wants to pursue a contractionary policy, it would sell some of the government securities it owns. When it sells the government securities to a bank for say $500 million, the bank of course would have to pay for these $500 million worth of securities. And so the Fed would simply debit their reserve account by the $500 million. And when that happens, $500 million in reserves would be reduced from the banking system. So again, that would be a, tend to be a contractionary policy. And that would, on average, make the federal funds rate tend to rise. And so what we can see, we can see this in a simple chart here, that by pursuing an expansionary policy by an open market purchase, so that would tend to shift the supply of reserves curve to the right, and that would tend to put downward pressure on the federal funds rate. It would work exactly the opposite with a contractionary policy. Open market operations that are, that are uh, sales would tend to shift the supply of reserves curve to the left, 
that would tend to push up the federal funds rate. So again, it works both ways. Now, turns out that the Fed uh, uses uh, open market operations, again, virtually every business day, and there are excellent reasons for this. So the Fed, for example, first has complete control over the volume of changes in reserves that it wishes to, uh, to undertake. Unlike with the discount window, which requires bank cooperation, because remember, one of the problems there we talked about is the Fed cannot make banks borrow from it through the discount window. However, all the Fed needs to do with open market operations is go in and make purchases and sales with market participants to get exactly the desired amount it wants. The Fed is also free to pursue large or small interventions. Ordinarily, under typical circumstances, its interventions might be relatively small, maybe measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. With the recent QE programs, their interventions were relatively large, you know, measured in the tens of billions of dollars over, over say, a monthly period. Also, open market operations are very fast. So if the Fed decides to pursue a change in, in policy, what it can do, it can, it can pursue that change in policy very rapidly, generally the very same day. And then finally, what happens is that errors are quickly reversible, meaning if it buys too much or too little and the federal funds rate doesn't behave in a way in which it desires, that can be undone very quickly because the Fed will get very fast feedback from the federal funds market to show that, gee, it, it, it went a little overboard or not quite enough in terms of what it was trying to pursue. Now, during the most recent financial crisis, open market operations became somewhat less important as some of the other new tools, for example, the term auction facility uh, and the others here acted as more kind of a lender of last resort style. However, those programs have uh, faded out and with the recent QE programs, the open market operations on a day-to-day -day basis uh, once again rules. So throughout most of its history, the Fed has used open market operations as its day-to-day -day standard uh, policy tool. Uh, some of these, uh, during, excuse me, during the financial crisis, uh, the, um, the policy tools, many of the new policy tools uh, were kind of variations on the lender of last resort. And then finally, now that we're in uh, the middle of a QE program, that open market operations, along with communication, uh, have become uh, more important than ever. Thank you very much.